Okay, so can you see the screen, everyone? Yes, we can see the screen. Don't worry. Okay, thank you. Uh, so today we are going to speak about artificial intelligence and in particular how it plays a, 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 a huge role in psychology today. Um, my name is Mark. I I'm a PhD candidate in psychology. My, I, my master's degree uh, in psychology was, is from Arizona State University. Uh, I've, before that, I've studied pharmacology. Um, so the background. And um, before we start, I would like to take a minute to think, all of you think, what is the first thing? that comes to your mind when, when, when you hear the term artificial intelligence, because um, it's, it's often used without much contemplation of what it really means. Um, and we always hear those two words now, artificial intelligence in, in things like uh, this has been designed using AI, this chatbot is AI based, this service is AI run, and, but when we think to the very basic of AI, like what is AI? So AI is an attempt or a product, which is the result of us humans trying to make programs or computers do things that people do, but better. So for example, a computer is programmed to do a, a, a task or, or list of tasks that we used to do, uh, but because these are problems, computers re usually solve these problems way, way, way more faster because they are programmed to be able to go through or skim through a multiple number of solutions. Our uh, brains could do. And this takes us to what is called the automation of activities that we usually associate with human thinking. For example, when, when it comes to decision-making or learning, we always, take some time to think. But the thing is, because computers could process all the inputs in a way more faster pace than our minds do. And on the other hand, computers also lack emotion in the way that they do not hesitate, think in an emotional way, the way we do. So. The art that perform functions that require the intelligence is the like the bottom line of what AI uh, is meant to do. Um, of course, there are many manifestations of that um, in in all aspects of our lives. The the current trend that has been going for like the past decade or so. Um, it, it is on AI having the form of a human, thinking like a human, talking like a human. Uh, so we, the, the thought was that in order to, to have people identify more with AI or understand AI more, then we should make him make it in, in, in a human form. Uh, so I would recommend everyone to watch a movie called Ex Machina. Um, it, it expounds on um, an, an, a, a person that later in the movie, it's not a plot or anything, but we, we know that it's an AI uh, uh, robot and not human. And the surprise lies in how AI could think. And there was actually a bit of a debate on whether um, an actual AI in reality could express emotions and think in a way that humans do. So 
the field of AI is actually computer science because it's it's actually a computer. It's 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 a, it's it has a processor that is uh, programmed to carry out specific lists of tasks. And people tend to think that AI is is um, is pretty new, but this is not accurate. But um, um, AI is part science and part engineering, and the, both those parts, the science part and the engineering part, are, are a bit too old. Uh, AI often um, study other domains in order to be able to implement those systems. For example, there is an, a mobile application now that is uh, concerned with the medical diagnosis. It's an AI-based. So, the, it asks you about the symptoms. You put a list of symptoms and it, it goes further to ask you another symptoms uh, because it's like a tree. Uh, you, you give an input here. The AI is programmed to go either this way or that way based on your answer. If you answer yes, it goes this way. If you answer no, it goes this, this way. And the yes has a multiple variations and, and all of these which way to go is determined by question. So the, uh, so the AI asks you the, the following question and based on your answer, it gets you one way. And this one way has a lot of different ways. And all of the ways are kind of too varied in, in, in such a way. And, and if you said no, it will get you to another uh, variation as well until you get a final answer. So this, uh model is actually applied in in many fields now in medicine it's there it gives you a final uh, diagnosis it's not really a medical diagnosis or anything but rather a provisional one in psychology or uh, psychological interventions it is present as well because um it it asks you th things about your mental health in 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 psychology or actually in um, in in therapy we use something called the DSM, uh, which is the diagnostic manual for all psychological disorders. Um, and this DSM now in its fifth version, so it's called the DSM-5. And the DSM-5 is actually the constitution of uh, mental disorders, how we um, diagnose mental illness. So. Uh, uh, because people really tend to use um, words that are usually attributed to mental illnesses uh, without much thinking uh, in, an, in, a, in, a, in sort of a widened or a broader way. So when someone is feeling bad, people easily go to label them as depressed. So a friend tells them, no, you're just depressed. Uh, you're going you're gonna to be fine or you're not or and maybe someone had a, a difficult situation or an event happening to them. People rush to say, oh, it's a trauma. It's a traumatizing event. This is not really accurate because these are kind of a stretched and widened uses of the words. Um, in clinical setting, we don't really use the words this way in order to label someone as depressed. Depression has a lot of um, variations. Uh, and these variations are coded. Um, each disorder is assigned a number. And for example, in depression, there is a major depressive disorder. This is a disorder. And in order for someone to be diagnosed with that, they have to fulfill particular diagnostic criteria. If they do not fill these diagnostic criteria, they cannot be uh, uh, um, diagnosed with, with, with MDD or major depressive disorder. This is applied to all mental disorders. In an anxiety, uh, it is the same. There is nothing called like an anxiety per se or by itself. There is a generalized anxiety disorder, a social anxiety disorder, and a lot of anxiety disorders. And in order for someone to be diagnosed with them, with any of these disorder, uh, they, ha they have to fulfill particular diagnostic criteria. So in AI, and this is how AI is, is um, 
is usually formed in psychology uh, or in, in, in clinical setting or in clinical psychology. The computer or the AI could ask you about one question that pertains to one diagnostic criteria. So for example, it could ask you about whether you have be, uh, been feeling completely and overwhelmingly sad or experiencing overwhelming feelings of sadness constantly, nonstop um, for the past 14 days. And if you say yes, this is the first diagnostic criteria in depressive disorders. So it, it going to, it's going to, to um, take you to the depressive disorders and then continues to ask you questions about how long have you been feeling uh, uh, having these symptoms uh, about other uh, uh, accompanying symptoms maybe uh, and really a lot of questions before making a final diagnosis. Uh, and if, if you fulfilled all of these uh, criteria, the AI will deem you as having, uh, uh, for example, a major depressive disorder. In trauma, it's the same thing as well. And really in any mental disorder, it's the same thing. But um, this is how like the basic AI model in psychology works. But the problem with, with this model is twofold. The first one is that it's easily fooled because you really need to just to uh, know the diagnostic criteria, which are really very easy to find or very accessible online, or um, you could not intentionally be willing to sabotage the test, but rather you may be just being, you may be like overwhelmed with your feelings. So you might take it a bit too far. You might exaggerate your responses unintentionally because you, you are in a moment that are not able to judge clearly. So it's very easy because it's self-reported um, to have kind of a diagnosis that doesn't really uh, fit you. Um, but how could the computer tell if you're lying? And this is the thing, it cannot because it deals with input. If you go to a, a therapist, he or she will deal with your input as well, but this input is life fed, like you're sitting in front of them telling them the story, uh, telling them how you feel, what happened, and everything related to the reason you, you, why you've come to visit. And they would evaluate what you say based on both the diagnostic criteria of the DSM, which the AI could do, but also how you were feeling when, when you were telling this story, how you were feeling when you were saying this and that and that and that, and generate, the job of the psychologist would be then to generate um, an input about how you feel, an input about what you did not say during the, um, uh, 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 the session. And what you didn't say, either intentionally or, 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 or non-intentionally really, kind of is kind of subjective like we cannot say for sure that this is really how you felt when you were saying this or 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 or, or there was actually something that you hate for sure or something like that but taking a non-verbal input is one thing that ai cannot really um mirror yet or produce um, and for, is this a decisive factor in making a diagnosis? For sure, uh, because it could make a difference in the final diagnosis uh, for someone to be diagnosed with one thing.
thing to someone being diagnosed with, with a completely different thing. So this is kind of a, an overall general idea of how AI is implemented in psychology. But how could you really tell if you're talking to maybe someone on the phone, because now AI is being implemented to, to, to speak on the phone. Uh, if you're talking with someone on the phone, how could you tell uh, if that someone is, a, is an actual human being or an AI, if they are, if they could, if they have, has all the information, they could have an answer to any question you ask. Um, and this, is, is a very old question because AI is a belief that if the brain is some sort of a biological computer, if the mind is computational, computational uh, means that the brain processes information in a way that could be replicated. And if this is the case, then it could be replicated. It's one of the uh, cognitive uh, psychology theories about the brain. These are pretty like um, complicated. There are uh, like three or four uh, complicated theories about how the brain works, but the computational theory is one of them. And it is the one that AI is based on. Um, and if, if, if the brain is merely computational, then the AI, could replicate the brain in a way that you could not tell the difference. Um, and for example, there's a scientist called Alan Turing and uh, he was uh, a pioneer in one of the first people that uh, worked on AI seriously. And he's kind of the father of all computers. He's the guy that computers uh, could have existed uh, I, as we know like he played the major major role in ai and in how computers work uh, this was back in the world war ii and he made a he actually made a machine he created a machine that um, kind of tries to imitate the human brain but way way fa faster and the context of that was the world war ii uh, the Germans in the World War II was using a code that changed every 24 hours. Uh, and no, ma no matter how the Allies uh, or the British were trying to work on how to, to decode the cipher, uh, they, they really couldn't because they only had a, a 24 hour window to work on something so complex and so complicated. <coughs> Sorry. And it, <coughs> if they became too near to crack the code, by the end of the day, it changes again. So everything they did went in vain and they tried as, uh, again from scratch. And the Germans had a machine that uh, generated a new code each day so they kept changing it each day and there was no solution to cracking it uh, uh the, the, it was too difficult that it was called the enigma um, and it was considered like kind of a fortune uh something that cannot be cracked no matter what and what Alan Turing did is, is that he was a mathematician and he thought if he could design a machine that uh, we feed it the code, everything we know about it, and the machine tries to sort out all possible solutions to, 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 to figure out a way to decode this enigma. But if the human mind needs like 30 years to do this, the machine could do it in less than 24 hours. And then if the machine could do it in one to two hours, for example, then we'll have a whole day ahead of us with an ability to interpret the uh, uh, German code without them even knowing it. And uh, this is actually believed to have maybe turned the, 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 the war altogether. And, and this uh, imitation, the, the, the test that he designed later after the war ended 
uh, it's called an, the imitation game. And it's a test that uh, was designed in a way that um, a question is asked, participants are, 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 are brought and two questions are asked uh, from a real person. So a real person asks a question two times, the same question is asked. And then this person or the participant receive an answer from both sides. And if you, provided that you're the one asking the questions, if you cannot tell which of the entities or which of the uh, uh, answer providers is the human and which is the computer, then you are fooled. And then the computer would be too intelligent in a way that it could mimic the human mind in a way. And this, with the Turing test, it was an obvious answer. So it was too difficult to crack. Then computers are as intelligent as humans. They could do everything that humans can. And to, the Turing test ha, has been like too difficult to crack. No one ever uh, really managed to crack it. But here comes this person. Um, and kind of designed a system that would act like what's called a Rogerian psychoanalyst. Rogerian is from a person called Carl Rogers. And he is the pioneer of a subfield in psychology called humanistic psychology which is really concerned with, uh, 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 with psychology or psychoanalysis from the uh, uh, human experience, from um, the dialogue that a person expresses. Um, and this system was, was to consist of the doctor. The doctor would be asking questions the human would be responding and the doctor using the response to ask another question and so on. And if the program was written in a way that would generate an English response and the follow time based on a group of patterns. In other words, if, they, if, if the participant answered in a way that identifies as a pattern, if, if such answer contained some words in a way that matched a particular pattern, the pattern then could be used to generate the next question. And the answer to that next question would be used or identified for the following question and so on. And this tree based model, like your answer would, would fit in a pattern of like, let's say four patterns. They could be actually 400, 500, it doesn't matter. But to simplify, let's say four patterns, okay? And if your answer fit one of these four patterns, Another question is asked accordingly, but what if your answer did not match any of those um, aforementioned four patterns? Then you'd go into a fifth place where you would be asking a, ask a clarifying question, and that clarifying question to identify a pattern from your response. And again, if your response is too ambiguous, you will be asked another uh, 
clarifying question and another clarifying question. Until you are fit in one of those criteria or in one of those patterns to be asked the following questions and so on. And it was designed in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way too clever. Uh, here is, this is actually the way it's designed that the AI or the computer, the system, no matter your answer was, was able to categorize you in one of the patterns. Which would usually take you to the following, uh, uh, um, to the following um, aspect. For example, the, it, you were, would be asked about, for example, why do you want to do this or that? And depending on your answer, you're going to be either asked, do you really think it's likely that this thing could happen? For example, let's say uh, um, something like this. Men are all alike. So the system would ask you in what way? You're gonna give an answer, but the answer is not uh, quite accurate. So you're going to be asked a clarifying question. Can you be more specific? And then based on your answer, your input, the computer could generate sympathy. I'm so sorry to hear that. And whether the, the patient has autonomy which is, do you think coming here will help you not to be unhappy? But this is asked after a confirmation from the client that they are unhappy. So the computer is programmed. If an acknowledgement came in, was reported, this question should be asked. And if an expression like this is said, a sympathy sentence is 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 uh, is used, and it's an input output process, but uh, really includes many many uh, 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 variations. But how useful is actually the Turing test? Um, this is how the Turing test worked, or or. Kind of it, it when when the Turing uh, 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 machine was used to crack the code, it really tried to track this process backwards. So instead of uh, um, an input is put and an output is produced by the by, by the machine, the machine tried to tackle this pro uh, process or 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 track it backwards. So it had the output, they had the coded messages and the machine tried to take these coded messages and analyzing into all the possibilities that could take it one step back and another step back and another step back and another step back until it reached its uh, original form. And in its original form, it was decoded. It was uh, normal English. So it would un be understood. Uh, and the challenge was that if if the AI could work forward, it could work backwards. Um, and I'm not going to go deep in the weeds in this aspect, but this is basically how the the uh, the safe was cracked. But there is another dilemma to this. Does if 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 the computer is too smart to understand to 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 reply to anything I say when I'm mentally ill, if I'm mentally ill, I go to an AI therapist or something, and everything I say, the AI therapist generates a perfect response. The AI expresses sympathy. The AI um, knows how to diagnose me 
accurately provided that I accurately uh, uh, report how I'm, I feel. So it really could may could do everything. But the question that arise that uh, was arising from this is, okay, so the computer is intelligent; it could generate well thought responses, but not not because it was well thought out, uh, but because it it was programmed uh, with endless numbers of, of possibilities. So they could accurately accurately identify what a person is particularly saying and design a response to that. But do they understand me, or or do they understand the speaker? And this was very important, particularly in psychology or in clinical setting, because. When you talk to a therapist or you talk to a dear friend or something, what is the most important thing? If you, many people would say that the most important thing when they speak to a therapist or even a friend, that they feel understood, that they feel that the person understands them. Um, and this is actually has been proven to be uh, of very important use in clinical setting, if a, a client is does not feel understood by the therapist, it affects the 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 uh, the uh, therapeutic process and the treatment. Even if the therapist was clever, even if they were able to diagnose properly, even if they were able to identify what is mentally wrong with this person with accuracy, but if they failed to communicate that they understand the person that they know, not just know, because this is um, a subtle difference, um, not just that they know what their problem are, but, uh, but, rather, but rather that they do understand them. Uh, and the dilemma uh, uh, was raised for AI here called the Chinese room problem. The Chinese room problem um, was created by a philosopher called uh, John uh, Searle in an attempt to de demonstrate that computers cannot be intelligent, cannot be truly intelligent, that they trick us in a way to think that they are intelligent, but in fact they were not. Um, so the Chinese room experiment consists of you in, a, in one side of the room, a book that contains all of the Chinese symbols that considered to be like a, 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 a translation book or something like that in a room. And that room was closed. Someone was locked inside the room with that book of Chinese symbols. And a Chinese speaking individual provides a question for you in that room. If you're locked in that room, you never understood Chinese, you do not know anything about Chinese, but this person provides you the question in writing. So a paper is uh, passed through under the door of that locked room, and you are able to find a matching set of symbols in the book. It's like a cipher. You decode the cipher, you get the book of Chinese symbols, you check the, the paper, the message that was passed under the door, and you find what each symbol means, and you write a response, also in Chinese. So because the, you know the person outside the door would not understand anything but Chinese, you want to respond to them, so you use the book of Chinese symbols again to generate uh, a, a, a response. And you pass that answer through the door 
to the person outside to read it. The person outside would read it and understand it because it's written in Chinese. So the person would reply back with another message. You would uh, use the book of Chinese symbols again to read the message, understand it. And then you write a, a response, but because the person outside the room cannot read anything but Chinese, you write the response in English or, or whatever your language was, and then you use the book of Chinese symbols to, uh, to, to, uh, to have their response in Chinese symbols. You pass it under the door, the person gets it, understands it. And after maybe a couple months, there is a strong relationship that is formed between you, you and the person outside the Chinese room. But the question here, if that person outside the room continue to speak with you in writing in the same way I just explained for maybe one year, five years, 10 years, would that make you learn Chinese or not? Does it, for example, let's say that after five years, uh, the room was cracked open, you got out. Would you be able to communicate with this person in Chinese? A simple obvious answer is no, because you do not really understand Chinese. You only used a book to decipher the messages and, and used the same book to, 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 to translate the responses that you wrote. It doesn't mean that you know Chinese, you, you really don't. And uh, you, you may be able to identify one or two uh, symbols, but you do not really understand Chinese. You cannot talk in Chinese. You cannot decipher anything in Chinese without the book. So you cannot be really truly intelligent in Chinese. And if the, uh, John Searle used this Chinese room dilemma as an analogy for the computer, that the Chinese room was very much like the computer. The person outside the room is us or anyone using the computer putting the input feeding the input to the person inside the room, which is the, the CPU or the processor of the computer. And everything that is programmed into the computer or the data is like the, 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 the Chinese symbols book. And the Chinese room itself is uh, the pathway for the data itself and the computer generate a response based on that uh, um, data is, that is programmed into it, but it doesn't really understand it. And if it doesn't really understand it, it cannot be really truly intelligent. And if it cannot be truly intelligent, then it uh, cannot um, replace the human brain or the human mind and it cannot do any job that requires an actual true understanding, such as psychology. Uh, for example, if someone was given the DSM, which is um, considered like a, a symbols book or something that uh, you, your only job was to give the input from the client and just um, see what this means, what this means, what this means, or if the grouping of symptoms like that is present, then this person has a trauma of some sort of a depressive symptom, a depressive disorder, or let's say schizophrenia or anything really. But if you are doing it only because you are translating it or using a book to decipher it, then you do not really understand it. And understand it. 
if you do not really understand it, then you would eventually fail to understand what the person here is actually saying. It would be like the Chinese room person that uh, don't really know Chinese. So the third question that you were able to solve the problem of communication with that person outside the room, and then the, the room or the person in the room should pass the Turing test because the Turing test was based to, uh, 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 upon one element of identification that you cannot tell whether the answer comes from a human or from uh, 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 a computer. And it's true because the answer uh, is came from a human in the Chinese room experiment, but the human did not really understand anything about the topic. So it would pass the, the Turing test without an actual understanding of the topic itself, which is the Chinese language or the, or the Chinese messages. But did you really understand the Chinese messages being communicated? Since you do not speak Chinese, you did not understand any symbols in the question or the answer, really, uh, or the storage of if, if all the pages that um, that person from outside the room gave you, you stored it into the Chinese room uh, by exposure. Like if you were exposed to it one time, two times, a thousand times, it doesn't make you know better. So can we truly say that you actually used any intelligence when deciphering this message? And by analogy, because you did not really understand the symbols that you interacted with, and neither does the computer understand the symbols that it interacts with, because it only deals with input, output, data. Um, it's a valid analogy. And therefore, Searle concluded that the computer is not really intelligent because it has no semantics. And I'll explain that uh, in a bit. But instead, it uses a symbol manipulating device. And this makes computers work solely on, on, on the arrangement of words and phrases to create well-formed sentences. And this structuring of statements or structure of sentences is called syntax, this word. So what syntax means is the clustering or the arrangement or the structuring of words and phrases. But on the contrary, the computer does not really use semantics. And semantics means that the process is not symbol based, that this word is not represented by that symbol and that's it, that's syntax, but rather it has a logic within this um, structure of words. So let me explain it in a bit. Um, if we have a sequence of words or a sequence of sentences, those words or those sentences have meanings. And those meanings are put in that way because of the context in which they were said. And if those meanings and if those contexts have a reason behind them or a meaning behind them, behind the way it was they were said, 
if they were said the way they were said due to a context or a meaning behind them or a logic behind them, that means they are semantic. But if they have only a set of rules that were followed in order to create the sentence structure in that way, that's the syntax. But there is no meaning in the syntax. Why? Because it followed a set of structures. They were designed that the, the, the purpose of their design was merely due to a set of predetermined rules. But if the reason behind the, the structuring is not a set of rules, or not a set of rules alone, but rather there is a meaning or a context behind that uh, 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 structuring, then it's semantics. And um, therefore, the computer could be intelligent in a way that it's able to identify the syntax uh, of everything, like because you could ha have inputs to the AI that is endless numbers of rules. It will encompass all of them, but it cannot really understand the meaning or the context behind everything unless you have trans transformed those uh, uh, meanings into some sort of rules that could be put or feed uh, feeded uh, 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 to, uh, to 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 the AI. Uh, an example of this is Chat GPT, uh, and and Chat GPT Plus, and um, if you if anyone used uh, Chat GPT before. They will know that ChatGPT is very, very intelligent in the way that it could produce uh, very complicated and complex responses to questions, but it needs to be asked the right questions. You have to be very specific with inputs. For example, if you ask ChatGPT a psychological question or present it to them a psychological uh, issue or a clinical issue or uh, um, a complete uh, clinical profile of someone and they will respond with a diagnosis but and if you change anything with the input anything it could change the result even if it is the same client with the same uh, 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 mental illness but because the inputs were missing or, or not uh, like enough, or maybe more than enough for the AI, the AI could go a different way and produce a different uh, uh, diagnosis. So AI is only intelligent in as much as the inputs that you feed them. If you feed it, with the right input, it will give you the right output. But this is a very delicate process because there is a very high, high chance that uh, the input you give, you think it's enough, but it's not for the AI, or maybe it's more than enough that the AI starts to give you alternative uh, diagnoses or alternative responses to the one that is most accurate to you. So, but in, in, with a human uh, therapist, the human therapist could actually provoke you to uh, have more input if needed from you because they have this semantics versus syntax or they have this awareness, they have this uh, deeper understanding that maybe there's something missing. Um, and this cannot be replicated uh, like so far with, with the AI.
So, um, computers also solve problems. We can clearly see that computers solve problems in, a, in an intelligent way as well. Yes, because solving problems does not really need much meaning behind it or a context behind it because solving problems only needs uh, 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 to deal with a set of rules, something that computers tend to be very, very good at. So where is this intelligence coming from? If the computers could solve the problems use, using a, the most complicated set of rules, where did it come from? And there are some counter arguments to the Chinese room one. Uh, the most famous of them is that the hardware by itself is not intelligent. The hardware of the computer itself is not intelligent, but rather the combination of the hardware, the software and storage is intelligent. In other words, or in the Chinese room terms, this argument or counter argument claims that in Chinese room terms, the person inside the room, when, when, when the message is passed, uh, tries to learn it, not just decipher it. So as they learn the language, they become better at it. So after five years or so, if they're learning Chinese every day, they will become, uh, 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 they will be uh, a very, very fluent Chinese speakers as well. Um, provided that the inputs are correct. We say that the human brain also has no opportunity to learn anything cannot be intelligent. It's just the hardware. Uh, yes, this basically means that the argument that the computers are not intelligent ignores the fact that the element of learning. For example, in the Chinese room experiment, it is presupposed that the only role of the person inside the room is to crack the cipher or the Chinese symbols and then uh, write a response and uh, 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 in Chinese symbols using the book without much learning. Because the element of learning, the input of learning is not there. But if the person outside the room was actually saying things in Chinese and teaching, um, the person inside the room, then maybe the person inside the room could learn Chinese. Um, another response is that a computer is void of senses and therefore uh, samples are meaningless. Uh, but the robot or the AI could be fed with meanings to these symbols and then they would be able to uh, ascribe meanings to symbols which was missing from the Chinese room experiment. Um, uh, uh, another response is called the brain simulator, which basically means that the computer could only be or mimic a brain if we designed it to, be, to do so. Um, for example, if we made a computer with a connection to everything that is that it exposes to, like if it's exposed to a new language, we teach it to it. We add the inputs of everything, not just the, 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 the symbols or how to interpret or anything like that. Uh, but rather, if we put all the inputs, it would, um, be able then to mimic the human brain, but provided that we provide the computer or the AI with all the things that we as humans are provided. So an example of this would be uh, in language acquisition or language development. If someone, uh, for example, if someone is taught a language, uh, they would maybe have a, a, a session with a, la a language teacher, for example. And the language teacher 
tries to teach that language with the meanings and the context and everything to, uh, 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 to the student. And if we dealt with the computer as a student and try to teach the computer everything about the language, it will learn it as well. So um, this would boil down to the brain versus computer or AI. And in this way, the brain with the responses to the Chinese room, the brain could become a form of a computer. This is actually true. Um, because the computer is made after the computational uh, theory of the brain and computer intelligence to an extent could be created through programming um, just as people become intelligent by learning. This is the most highlight of what we've said so far. Just as people become intelligent by learning, not by itself, not, not, not by intuition, not by exposure, mere exposure to anything, but by learning, computers could become intelligent by programming as well. Um, also, the computer could perform the task without understanding what it's doing. Um, and the brain could do both. Does the brain understand what it's doing when it solves the problems? Yes and no. Yes, it could understand the problem first and no, it could only decipher the problem just like in the Chinese uh, uh, room. And the brain could do both, but the computer in order to do both has to be programmed to do so. Um, this should be the end of our session. Um, I hope it was uh, beneficial. I know that the topic could be a little bit complex, a little bit overwhelming. I'm happy to um, receive all of your questions. So yeah, any questions, please? As a question, you can use the hand reaction to raise a question or leave a comment in the chat as well. Okay, I see Nelly Nama uh, raising your hand, uh, please. Uh, I will also, yeah, I will also open the chat. Um, okay, Nelly asks, why is it that a combination of hardware, software, and storage is intelligent than the hardware? Uh, very good question, Nelly. Um, Basically, the hardware is the Chinese symbols book. Think of it as, for example, you want to learn French. You have never exposed uh, to French, but you want to learn French. So you get a French dictionary back home and try to study it, but you find it difficult to learn only using the dictionary because the dictionary doesn't explain to you the grammar. The dictionary doesn't tell you why sentence, how sentences are structured and why they are structured in, in a particular way. But you go to your teacher the following week with the dictionary and the teacher starts to explain everything in the dictionary for you. Explain how the verbs, the atter, avoir, how the verbs are, are, are how the sentences are formed. The teacher starts to give you, gives you the meaning of these verbs, 
why, for example, the tenses are formed in this way, why tenses like a passé composé is formed in this way, or why the future is, uh, is put in this way. And think of this explanation as the software part. The software part is the uh, uh, programming, the software programming to the hardware. So, so the hardware is the brain, the CPU, the brain, your brain is intelligent, but it cannot learn language by itself. It needs a teacher, a process. So the hardware is a brain and the dictionary. The process itself is a software. And if you go to one class, it's not enough, two classes, three classes, you get better with time because you, uh, 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 because your memory store what you have learned about fr uh, French in the previous classes. And this is the storage. So uh, 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 the combination of these three, the hardware, the software, and the storage or the exposure makes an intelligent product than the hardware itself. The hardware itself is like the Chinese room uh, without any learning. So I hope this answers your question. Um, Ukiria or Uchiria. Uh, can you have another class of this? I'm not sure, uh, maybe. Um, we have Emmanuel and Richie raising their hands. Okay, uh, I see Emmanuel first. So yeah, please, Emmanuel, go ahead. What, what's your question? Okay, so with uh, the increase in knowledge in AI, so there is this fear and uh, of course, it was even exhibited by Elon Musk that uh, AI is a threat to to uh, to humanity. So the better uh, you just unlay to us uh, all the limitations that uh, this uh, system has. So, do you think we will ever get to that situation in the future? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Very good question. Um... We, 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 we don't really know to, to uh, like, this is the, the uh, most honest answer I could tell you. We don't know because for example, uh, we don't think that such a, uh, a revolutionary discovery could be made. Such a revolutionary invention could be made when Alan Turing discovered, um, made the machine to crack the Enigma cipher. No one could believe it. Uh, this is actually believed to have ended the World War II. No one could believe that something like this could have happened. And just as today, we think that AI has limits. We think that uh, AI can do so much, like, uh, like it, it cannot do everything that humans do, but maybe in 100 years from now, 200 years from now, it will do what we think now it cannot, just like 50 years ago, it was found to be able to do what they, at the time, thought it cannot be possible. Um, so I hope this answers your question. Yeah. Um, Richie, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so very much, uh, Matt. Um, uh, this, this is um, such a wonderful presentation. I must say that um, you have made AI um, to become more like ABC, uh, actually the understanding uh, um, outside, of, outside of a whole lot of, um, I wanna say confusing, but just like um, a man, uh, I think it was, a, was it a man that asked the last question? Yes, uh, some of the fear mongering fact things that are there, but, the fears are still there, just like you, like you rightly uh, have have said. You know, um, I I'm really fascinated about the uh, linkages between AI and psychology, uh, uh, especially when it comes to um, counseling and uh, coaching uh, aspects uh, of of um, um, psychology. And I, I Emmanuel took part of what I wanted to uh, uh, ask questions about, dwell about. You know, 
Well, you've answered him, but I, I just, from my thinking, from my thinking, is, is this. Look, you've mentioned two key people, well, two key studies, okay? The, uh, the person that decoded the Enigma messages and the Chinese room programming. Now, those were human beings. Okay, let's understand this. Let's also tie this with the presentation you made to say, the computer cannot think by itself. Humans think for the computer, program the computer, teach the computer. When you say program, you're actually talking about teaching, training. So for as long as we have humans who can think beyond certain levels that other human beings think and they have the capacity to uh, engine, for engineering, for science, AI would always do more. And it now depends on who that human being is. Is it thinking for the good of humanity or is it thinking for destroying humanity? So that's the, where that lies. But then that doesn't, that's not the, fear is not our thing here. Yeah, we are thinking about how to develop society, how to go from this generation to the next generation to the next generation. So Mark, here is my uh, question now. In, in psychology, on the, having the understanding that human questioning, correct me, sir, if I, um, if I didn't get that right. If I have the understanding that human questioning is still superior, because, well, in research, um, from what I understand from that is that, well, computers can always do the quantitative analysis of data they can they have no they don't have much capacity well i say correct me they have much they don't have much capacity to do qualitative data analysis so we, we, from you saying now that are you saying that human questioning human probing okay is superior to ai probing that's my question um thank you thank you um um and thinking about your question i think that the the, the current stance uh on 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 the interaction between uh, humans and ai um there are there were times when like i said uh previously there were times when we did not think that it's possible to even get to the point where we could plan program something to do uh, 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 such a complicated process and it happened and the the key thing here or the um, like the current um issue that might answer your question lies in a current debate on whether we could program the ai to think to to uh, because like i said the programming itself is kind of is like teaching the ai something and uh, for for the ai to be able to produce it later but is it possible to teach the ai to learn by itself like if this is possible, like if, is it possible to teach the AI to do this process of learning by itself without any human intervention? For now, it's not possible because someone has to program uh, 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 the AI to, to do this and that and that. But if this has become possible in the future, if, 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 if a, some sort of programming could be implemented for the AI to program itself, to, to move by itself, to develop by, by itself, maybe, maybe, maybe some sort of um, an AI programmer, just like a human programmer. Um, it's not, maybe it's not possible now, but we do not know if it's going to be possible in the future, because like I said, such revolutionary steps 
we maybe maybe it's it doesn't make any sense now i would if you said that if you said oh it doesn't make sense i would agree but 50 years ago it did not make sense at all to discover something like this uh maybe it's 70 years now so it didn't make any sense so maybe in 100 years from now it will make more sense uh, than uh, than than it does today so i hope i hope this answers your question um and thank you, thank you for your time. So I see you, Kiria, or you, Shiria. Um, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm saying the name correctly. P please, your question. Yeah, thank you so much for, for today's um, lecture. I really pick so much and um, a good insight into the computer and uh, the relationship to human brain. So the question I want to ask and is the fact that this computer is being programmed with such intelligence. I'm thinking about the future of humanity because if the computer is created and programmed to do great and mighty things because it's a great success to us, the humanity, I'm, I'm thinking if we so much depend on the computer, do you think that humans will have intelligence? Because I can see a lot of things, people just put in things, the computer produces it for them. Most people don't even read it. They don't even you know, try to put something inside their own uh, brain. Like you said, uh, for us to be intelligent, we need to put in knowledge and also retain the knowledge. So now if people are giving computer or AI, everything to do for them. How does the human being retain their own intelligence and also grow to meet up with the artificial intelligence? Because I see the man going into ignorance or people who, who are coming into what they call people without knowledge. Because it's not about telling the computer to do something for you. How do you go put it the the knowledge inside you. It's true that people created it. The intelligent people uh, created intelligence in the computer. What about people who are not able to, to put something into their own brain and also retain the knowledge in the future? That's what I'm saying. When we begin to depend so much on artificial intelligence. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I think that it will come it will always come down to um our own awareness of ai and our own use of it it's like um uh i think it, it, it it's it's sometimes a cliche but uh it's like a double edged weapon people could use ai in many many aspects including good ones and bad ones they could be used to um to harm people and it could be used for good purposes it it will always again it, uh, the ai cannot have an awareness of its own so uh, up until now at least so it cannot be good or bad by itself it's a tool and like any other tool it could be used either way and it will be left for the person who uses it because at the end computers are not using ai for, for 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 ai purposes we are the ones who use ai if if no one like if we wake up one day no one uh opens up their computers no one using their smartphones no one using ai for 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 any given reason ai itself becomes useless so it's only as useful as much as we use it and it's only useful and it's only like uh, meaningful to be used uh, uh, um, in, 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 in what we are using it for. So um, I think it will always come down to how we decide to use it. We could work on that. And this is not something that, uh, that, ha that has AI input or, or, or it even relates to AI. It relates to our own understanding of ethics and our own ethical standards that 
uh, in need for evolvement because the, uh, our own ethical standards are in need to evolve with the new, um, uh, because for example, a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, there, is, there was no AI existed. So the ethical standards did not need to take anything like that into consideration because they did not exist, but now they do. And therefore this calls for revision and reconsideration to how we should interpret our own ethical standards in light or in terms of the new technology that is available and constantly developing. I hope this answers your question. Thank you very much. Um, um, uh, anyone, I'm not sure if anyone uh, has uh, any other question uh, where we, I, I think that that's it. Thank you very much, everyone, um, for your time. I hope you found the presentation helpful. Um, back to you, Antonella. Uh, 